All right, the last uh, panel for this morning is our Getting to Zero Coalition. Uh, please join me in welcoming Soren Toft, Jan Dieleman, Isabel Durant, and Bryony Worthington to the stage. Soren, I think we'll go ahead and start with you. All right, so what are the objectives of the Getting to Zero Coalition, and why has Maersk joined the initiative as a founding member? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for, for having me on stage and, and talking about a subject that's at least uh, dear to my, uh, my heart. Um, well, I, I mean, the way I would put it is that at Maersk, we are already uh, one of the energy efficient leaders. Um, We've improved our efficiency 45% since about 10 years ago. And that was a very bold target when we set that out. Uh, and we didn't know all the answers. And now we have uh, made another bold target, and that is to be net zero emitting by 2050. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't know all the answers, just like 10 years ago, uh, how to get there. We don't have all the, the great ideas. But we are setting this course out um, because it's necessary for the world, uh, it's necessary for future generations, and quite frankly, I believe for shipping, it's necessary to do something about this, to be a true and viable servant of global trade, which we've been for the past several decades. And um, the Getting to Zero Coalition is exactly a vehicle to, to address this, to, uh, to make efforts, how we can innovate, how we can scale, how we can collaborate around uh, energy efficient uh, solutions. And um, and that's why we have done it. And I think for Maersk as well, I mean, yes, we made great strides, but we have only been able to keep our emissions flat. So all the great initiatives have only made us, you know, be flat because growth has, you know, taken off. Right. And therefore, we need completely new energy solutions, completely new uh, fuel types. And that's what the Getting to Zero Coalition sets out uh, to address. And that's why we are on board from the get-go. No, that's right. And we're actually sitting in the region that is increasingly responsible for the onward global growth and including aggr aggregate numbers of trade, right? So just keeping the level of where we're at is no longer going to be feasible as we see uh, increasing numbers of people go into the middle classes, consume more, and become of our trading system. Um, so Maersk is recognizing this early, and I, I thank you very much for that. Jan, I'd love to, to go to you next, if I may. Yes. Cargill, um, a founding member of the Getting to Zero Coalition, could you share with us a bit how you see the role of charters in driving the decarbonization of shipping? Yeah, no, thanks, uh, thanks for having me on the stage and thanks for that question. Um, it starts off a little bit as well with what do we really mean with a charter? And I was thinking about this the other, the other week. And are we talking about that as being the, the operator? Is it the end user? Is it, um, is it the cargo owner? And I think for a lot of different industries and segments, that might be a slightly different answer. But wherever you take it, in the end of the day, if you want to decarbonize this industry, you'll have to work together as a supply chain. And everyone in that supply chain has a role to play, so i.e. also the charter or whatever you want to call that party in there. And I think the one thing that we can really, really bring is, first of all, to engage with the people, uh, not only just with uh, the, the ship side, I would say, of it, but there's also a big infrastructure side to this. Um, it's also about collaboration, and uh, there's a lot of collaborations taking place, and I think there will be even more coming going forward. And in the end of the day, a lot of these initiatives will have to basically get financed. And having a signature like a cargo under a commitment there is, is sometimes the way that you can actually push these things over the line. And we feel that responsibility. We want to be a responsible operator in this industry. And, uh, and that's why we're also joined at Z uh, Getting to Zero Coalition. Mm. Thank you very much, Jan. Let me next turn to Isabel, uh, if I may. From a, a trade and development perspective, Isabel, how can we combine the need to transition to low carbon shipping future with the needs of developing countries and these emerging market classes? 
Yeah, thank you for that question because I am a UN person, uh, not IMO, <laughs> but UNCTAD. UNCTAD is an organization from the United Nations working on trade and development. Our trade could help for the developing countries and in the maritime sector, of course, it's completely interconnected and the interconnection uh, means that we have to work together and it's important to work with all the countries. So I think that this transition is uh, so important, this ecological transition, decarbonisation decarbonization transition is so important, but we are not equal regarding this challenge. And uh, especially this, the small state island or the landlocked country are of course not in the same situation as others. And I would like to use it because just for on safety question, uh, the previous speaker spoke about three reasons why we have to do that. And first, if I take the same, the same uh, uh, structure, uh, we have for statistical reasons, uh, we, we have to do that. And we have to do that because we know that uh, the trade volume is expected to double over 2050, 2050. so it means the, that if The trade we volume is set, can we just say this again? The trade volume is set to double. Yes. By 2050. Yes. So it's the, regarding these challenges, we cannot, of course, business as usual is not an option, and it's why this zero coalition is so important. Secondly, uh, if we take all the argument and the economic argument, I think that what the young awarders say just before us shows that we have to change the model and the, the business model regarding the economic profitability of the sector. And the third reason, which is uh, in the pre with the previous speakers the most important, ocean is really our common good, our common environmental good. And if we want to be able to be responsible in the next decade, and uh, when we look at the young generation, what did you do? I will not use the Greta Thunberg example. Nevertheless, all those young generation asking for more transition and uh, urgent transition, I think that we have to do that uh, uh, shortly. And it's why our responsibility is only that is really to accompany and to equip the developing countries and the developing ports, ports authorities, etc., to do their job properly in order to be part of this transition and not only to be the victim of the problems economically, statistically, but also uh, environmentally, because they are the pioneers, the, sm the, 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 the poorest countries are the first uh, which will pay the most uh, uh, important uh, regarding the environmental questions. So it's why we have to work together. And I'm very happy to see uh, today industry, industry, maritime industry, discussing financially safety uh, and all the environmental issues together because I think that the model have to change uh, absolutely and shortly. Terrific. Thank you so much, Isabel. Brian, great to see you again. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund uh, is part of the Getting to Zero Coalition, of course. Could you share with us what you see as the benefits of bringing industry, governments, and NGOs together in a joint effort such as this? Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, it's great to be here. Um, uh, we're very happy to be part of this coalition because we think this is a great and exciting sector within which to tackle this challenge of how do we shift to a zero emissions economy globally, and the reason we think shipping is so exciting and dynamic is because unlike many sectors, you have a convening body that helps you set common rules in the IMO. And that's a real gift. There are many sectors at the moment facing transitions as the pressure to move away from fossil fuels increases, but they don't have the benefit of a fora in which to set common rules to try and level the playing field. So you have a, an amazing asset. And we're really keen to try and bring more voices into the IMO. We need to hear more diverse uh, business voices and uh, academics and other UN bodies paying attention to what's going on in London in the IMO sessions. Because the opportunity here is really great. If we can find, if we can learn from other sectors that have moved along the decarbonisation challenge already, for example, the electricity sector, the power sector, all it takes is some pretty smart policies to unlock billions and billions of investment into new industries. And why, why should shippers care? Why should ship owners care? Because essentially at the moment, your biggest outlay is your fuel costs. And you're in a world in which you're, you're a price taker. And essentially th there's an opportunity as we shift into a more diverse fuel model for you to be part of a new energy system where 
we're going to have many more diverse players and many more people entering into this market, which will ultimately mean you're less beholden to one or two options and you can look at diverse systems. So to bring that into focus, um, if you imagine a world in which we're using hydrogen as our main propulsion carrier in the future, you can make hydrogen from sunlight, water and air. That means countries which have got an abundance of those of natural resources can suddenly start to play in the energy market. And ship owners and ships visit every part of the planet. So you will be potentially the buyers of these new fuels and you can start to invest upstream in the manufacture of the fuels you consume. That, that's, a, that's a big vision. That's a vision that this sector can deliver far more effectively and efficiently than any other sector that we've looked at uh, on the, in the global economy. So why should you care? Because it's going to make good business sense and you're going to make money from this. This is a trillion dollar market that's about to be broken open and become much more diverse. And I think this sector has all the right characteristics to make that work and happen at speed and at scale. And that's the challenge that we would love to help you shape and, and make happen through policies enacted in the IMO. How exciting is that? The global maritime shipping industry being the lead for other sectors and taking on this critical, important work. Thank you very much. Let's go back to Soren, if I may. Uh, so Soren, you were on stage at the UN Climate Action Summit in New York, which was a great deal of fun in September. Uh, what impact does it have? when the shipping industry shows leadership on the global stage? Well, I, I think first of all, I mean, the climate situation I call normally a crisis. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real issue we have in front of us. And I think we, we all need to, to realize that. I mean, the, the situation is, is, is serious. Yeah. And uh, I take it very serious, and, and uh, frankly, my kids, uh, they take it serious and demand uh, answers, amongst others, from their father. Um, so, so uh, you know, being on the UN stage made a lot of sense because it's, it's really, you know, global solutions and international collaboration that, uh, that is necessary. And uh, the fact that we in the Getting to Zero Coalition were offered this opportunity by the UN Secretary General, I think, was uh, phenomenal. We were on stage with 67 heads of states, only about 30 business leaders. Mm. Um, another 60 heads of state wanted to have been on stage, but there was no time. <laughs> um, and, um, and I think, um, you know, the founding members together with the World Economic Forum, together with GMF, uh, made a really wise choice. And of course, we got a bit lucky and hard work to get on stage and to be able to broaden the, the message there. Uh, of course, uh, the, that was the easy part to be on stage and, and you know, represent the, the coalition. Now the hard work starts and, uh, and the hard work hopefully starts uh, also and, and gets, you know, uh, pursued further in this, uh, in this summit. But I think uh, it was a good start and we got a, a lot of attention. Now we've got to make it, uh, make it count. I'm going to go back to this. Now the hard work starts. Um, because we talk a lot about the accomplishments, but it's the hard work and the collaboration and the individual and collective agency together that makes something like this possible, makes the September announcement possible and the onward progress of this coalition as well. Um, so thank you very much for that, Soren Yen. Uh, it is no secret uh, that having commercially viable zero emission vessels operating in deep sea trade lanes by 2030. Like this, this is a big challenge. This is a big challenge. It's our moonshot, so to speak, right? So where we are now, what do you see as the main barrier? I, I think you're right, then we cannot underestimate the task in front of us, but it also makes it exciting, I think. I, I'm not going to go into the obvious ones, which I think is, is around technology. And I think if you read around in the newspapers and everything else, you'll see 40 ways of getting there and everybody <laughs> has his own opinion. Uh, it's not, not going to talk too much about the other obvious one, which I think is the economical viability of some of those solutions, right? And uh, I think we cannot forget that because in order to really, really get traction, they need to be sustainable also from a financial point of view. I think the real, real challenge is, and that's going a little bit what Bryony was saying earlier, we need a legal framework. Hmm. We need a legal framework, we need a level playing field. 
And this is not just around maybe a price on carbon or so, but also around some of the safety uh, aspects, the environmental aspects of some of these technologies, because people need to make decisions and need to know where they're standing. And, and I think that is the, the thing that is missing today. And we can talk a lot about technologies and stuff, but if we can't get the legal framework worked out, I think we have the risk of running in circles. And, and specifically around the carbon side, I think if the IMO is not able to pull this off very, very quickly, and, and we all know it's very difficult, I think the risk is that a lot of jurisdictions are going to do their own thing. And I think that could throw us back. And that could actually also mean that a lot of the money that that scheme potentially could generate is not going to find its way back into maritime. So I think that is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have there. Isabel. Yes. In the last, say, several years, there's been increased public pressure on politicians and businesses to act on climate change. So what should we do as a maritime industry to prepare ourselves for the court of coming public opinion? Yes, but I would ju jump to what you just said on the necessity to have a legal framework. I am a former minister of transport in my country 15 years ago. And uh, I, when, I, when I, go, I go back to what said the deputy prime minister in the beginning of the session, explaining how the multilateral discussion on international level is difficult. Maybe it's you, the private sector, industry, able to show how multilateralism is possible through you in order to push and to make a pressure on the, the, the head of states, the ministers, on global level, multilateral level, to be, to be able to take this legislation, because a national legislation on it is not useful. National legislation uh, is a, it's really a, a way sometimes to protect your industry, your specific advantage, your position, etc. in the market. You need, we need an international fr legal framework in order to show us where we have to go. Uh, and to, to achieve this goal, I think that we need a multilateral approach of the private sector in order to really make pressure uh, on the international uh, places where I was also in New York uh, uh, for the, 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 the climate summit, summit. It's nice and I think that it's very important and the Secretary General of the UN is really committed to let us move. But nevertheless, you feel as me and you know as me, if you look at television or you, you, you take the newspapers every day, we are in a, in a, in a, in a situation where protectionist approach is often the case trade war, uh, protection, barriers, etc. So I think that uh, young generation, you kids, my kids, but also industry, have to show that yes, multilateralism is able to solve the solution and that a legal framework is useful in order to uh, achieve our goals uh, or environmental or transitional goals that we have to achieve. So it's why I think that uh, we don't have to wait for a legal framework, we have to act and try to, to, to change the dynamic from the bottom and not waiting for something which will come from a UN system uh, so easy. Today, the UN system or the UN multilateralism is in difficulties to adopt new rules, even in the WTO. There is no possibility to take new decision. So it's why we have to do something from our side without keep and keeping in mind that the multilateral system has to stay or compass, otherwise we will lose a lot of things. So at a time when our global multilateralist frameworks are under pressure, are unraveling in some areas, we can no longer afford to wait for guidance from top down. The leadership starts here, from the industries working with partners across the maritime spectrum, to have those solutions and that leadership come from the bottom up. And we've got the silver lining and the weakening multilateralist framework at the global level is that you have a real chance to shape what that framework should be from your real life experiences of uh, ways that will be commercially viable but clean, safe, efficient and that makes sense for the operation of this industry. So thank you very much for that perspective. Uh, Bryony, uh, so you've actually been looking into some of the opportunities uh, that the transition to zero carbon fuels offers. Could you share with us a little bit more about this? 
Um, yeah, sure. Um, that's kind of what I alluded to in, the, in my opening remarks, is that um, we see this very much as an opportunity, not a, not a threat. And it's uh, a way of um, basically hedging yourselves against two risks. One is that society is waking up to the impacts of climate change, so it's going to be increasing pressure on all companies, uh, and there'll be litigation and other, you know, it, it, we're starting to get into a world where uh, the business as usual is no longer going to be sustainable. So there'll, there'll be lots of changes coming. Um, so, and at the same time, you've seen um, already now investment into uh, cleaner technologies on land starting to spill into this sector already. So you're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. The opportunity is there to learn from what's happened on land, where we've seen electrification emerging as a really good challenge to uh, into the transport sectors. Uh, so electrification for short sea shipping, uh, we can see you know emerging into into particular routes very quickly. But obviously for long distance, you, you're not going to be able to run on batteries. So then it's into alternative propulsion and the, I think the ICS call it the fourth propulsion revolution which you know I think is a great way of phrasing it um, and now we can see uh, different fuels emerging uh, most of them are going to be a hydrogen derivative I think because hydrogen is everyone's friend you can make it from everything you can convert gas into hydrogen you can use nuclear to make hydrogen you can use renewables to make hydrogen so it's a really interesting and, and important vector for energy and then for ships, if you combine it with nitrogen from the air, then you've got a, a, a fuel that's actually substitutable into the engines as they are today with minimal um, conversion, mi minimal ado adoption, adaptation. So there's a kind of drop-in solution that's kind of being gifted to you. And interestingly, those of you who've fitted scrubbers on your ships, you'll already be having to deal with ammonia uh, as it's used to, to clean out the, the sulfur from the, from the chimneys. So, it, it, you can see a pathway emerging here where hydrogen or electrofuels are uh, entering the market in, in particular niches where, where they become available early. And I think getting to that first 1% of penetration is going to require some really bold leadership and quite a lot of um, national and multilateral bank support to try and get those practical projects underway. Then we're going to have a period where we need to try to keep keep supporting these more expensive fuels over the next 5%. And then someone's described this, uh, I think it was Michael Liebrich at um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. After the 5%, waiting for the 5% will take a while, but then it'll be like a sneeze, because then it'll go immediately <laughs> fast. Because once those technologies have brought down the costs, once you've got the cost of electrolysis down, it'll become so much better and easier to use that fuel that everyone will adopt it. So it's getting from 1% to 5%, that's the challenge. And that's where we need support, leadership, private sector leadership, multilateral bank, and you know, member states, quite frankly, putting, putting some public money behind it. And then we, then we go from there. And uh, it, it won't take much. The ele electrolyzers are currently hand-built. They're really expensive. But once we get to 50 gigawatts of installed electrolyzer capacity, then we start to see the cost really tumble, and it will start to be really cost competitive. So you've got to get over that hump. You need support. Um, no one's expecting everyone to do this without some sort of subsidy. But it won't be a subsidy forever. and uh, It'll be a short burst, and then you'll be free and be using fuels that are much less volatile and in the hands of many more players. So it'll be a much more diverse market, and you'll ultimately benefit from that. So we all need to get ready for the sneeze. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Last question for Soren. Soren, you've been open about the fact that Maersk doesn't have all the answers for making zero emission vessels commercially viable today. But what are the potential outcomes, including from this summit, that can accelerate the decarbonization of shipping? Yeah, so so we have been we have been clear that we believe it's uh, it's uh, you know different energy sources that's needed. I mean the the solution is perhaps more on land than it is uh, at sea. And we've been working on on a on a working hypothesis, uh, and we've been over the last six months doing a larger modeling exercise together with Lloyd's, together with UMass, together with DTU, where we tried to you could say narrow the field of what we believe are the viable uh, the viable sources and we felt that was necessary because of course we want to stay open minded mm -hmm. but uh, as you also alluded to 2030 is not very far away if you want to develop these uh, new fuels uh, so uh, so we did this together with a lot of experts and we have tried to zoom in on on three fuels that we believe could be should be uh, you know the viable ones for the future so basically uh, fuels uh, either an alcohol uh, type which we also launched just uh, uh, late last week uh, another uh, study on 
uh, a biomethane or an ammonia uh, fuel. And obviously it doesn't mean that uh, we will not uh, consider uh, other fuel, uh, fuel types, uh, we will, but we'll zoom most of our work into this under what we call Project uh, Fast Track together with Lloyd's to really see if we can get some momentum in this. And, and personally I hope that from this summit also, you know, we can get some of the concrete ideas and maybe even concrete projects launched uh, around uh, these three fuels or, or other types of uh, fuels. We are then, in addition to that, also today already using uh, drop-in fuels. Uh, in fact, uh, used cooking oil uh, we're dropping into the heavy fuel uh, as, an, as a little offset. So they are there, but we don't believe they are, they are really scalable. We need to go into other directions, uh, into the three that I just mentioned. Excellent. So on top, Jan Dieleman, Isabel Durant, and Bryony Washington. Everyone join me in thanking our Getting to Zero Coalition panelists.